Thank you so much, uh, Claudio, for this uh, very kind introduction. Thank you also for uh, the organizer for this very kind invitation. So my task in the next 20, 25 minutes will be to have an overview of the cytosorb um, issue and why I believe that it would, could be the most promising approach in sepsis. There are some issues that we have to look at, and one of the very important ones is blood purification targets. What is your rationale to use blood purification in a septic shock patient? This is very important. We will see we have sometimes strong rationale, sometimes very weak rationale, and this has to be really uh, put in in bracket because it's so important. Um, we have also to think about biologic rationale in terms of what kind of hypothesis do we have to say that removing cytokine might improve survival. So we have several models, the cytotoxic model, the peak concentration hypothesis from our chairman Claudio Ronco, another cytotoxic model, the threshold modulation from all groups, and then a very recent, very interesting uh, hypothesis about the cytokinetic model, which I will show you. Then after, we, I will describe you what is a sorbent. Is it somewhat like a classical membrane or not? Uh, why make cytosorb so unique? Uh, how to perform it? Like an hemoperfusion with CRT, pre, post, who knows? Uh, animal and human data, and then some conclusion. So, I have one set of questions for you, and if you could use your uh, smartphone, please. So, first, uh, high volume infiltration is working in some RCT in septic shock with AKI. That's the first. Second, the rationale of blood purification is well understood for CRT or high volume hemofiltration. Third, the Euphrates study is fully negative, as we've been told last year in the SSICM in Milan. Four, has been shown that selective therapy are better than unselective therapy. And last, we have no large RCT, not underpowered, that show that BP is working in sepsis. And so, we start the vote. 20 seconds, please. The chairman has to stay neutral. <laughs> okay, very interesting. I will not give you the answer now, but at the end of the talk, we will repeat the question. Excellent. So, in the past, we were mostly using convecting uh, technique. Cascade hemofiltration, high volume, high cutoff. They all be negative in randomized controlled trial. So now we move on to couplet um, uh, hybrid technique or adsorptive technique. Uh, in this column you see CPFA, sorbent, PMX, ECMO, and then here uh, adsorption, non-selective membrane, semi-selective membrane, and very selective uh, device, polyxin mixing B. Those two are more science fiction. So we'll really focus on this. Great. Now, what is the biologic rationale? So I spoke first about the peak concentration hypothesis. So basically during sepsis you have peak of pro-inflammatory mediator, also of anti-inflammatory mediator, and you are trying to cut down the peak to try to decrease the 
blood concentration of the mediator in the blood stream and hopefully improve uh, organ failure and perhaps survival. And one of the good examples is endotoxin because endotoxin, that's a very good rationale. It's simple, one single target. It's very robust. So if you have someone with a high level of endotoxin above 0.6, you know that if you are able to remove endotoxin, you may have a good chance to improve his status and also to improve perhaps survival. That's a very strong rationale. That's an ideal rationale. Okay. Now, you say, well, last year I've been to the session hot topic in uh, Milan, and they said, yes, we had 400 patients with septic shock, with an endotoxin level above 0.6, and 200 control, and 200 with PMX therapy, two hours, two consecutive days. And the study was negative, 5% difference in mortality. Is this the end of the story? Perhaps no. Why? Because in May 30, there was a release by Spectral who is running the study in the US. And they were doing a postdoc analysis. And in fact, where you are above 0.9, the endotoxin is rising up. Almost impossible to get all the endotoxin out of the patient. And they were looking at the patient with multiple organ dysfunction syndrome above nine. That leaves them 200 patients. And this time, when looking with control, and a uh, treated patient when the endotoxin was below 0.6 and 0.9, the difference in mortality was this time significant with 11% difference in mortality and a p-value below 0.05. So obviously, this study has cost about $60 million, and I doubt that the FDA will grade it like this and allowed to use this and reimburse it. So probably they will ask another study, but we'll get the body for this. But very interesting to watch. Watch this space for sure. Now, we move on to a second uh, biologic rational hypothesis, which is the threshold immunomodulation hypothesis, which we put together with James Matson from the US. So we have a cytokine removal from the blood compartment leading to removal of cytokine at the tissue level, some kind of equilibrium, okay? And blood level in the, in the bloodstream do not necessarily fall, but because of the inflama inflammatory mediator are coming from the tissue back into the blood because you are removing from the blood, then they're coming below the threshold of activity of the process, and the process are held. So therefore, we speak about threshold immunomodulation. There was a last hypothesis where they call this mediator delivery hypothesis, and this was you because we are exchanging a lot of fluid during CRT, three to six liter, especially in high volume, and then we increase the flow in the lymphatic uh, circulation 20 to 40 times. So, briefly, peak concentration hypothesis, we remove cytokine in the blood and we have effect in the inflammation, try to break down. Threshold modulation, there is an equilibration with the tissue and the blood, and then below the threshold, everything stops. And the mediator delivery, you increase the flow in the lymphatic circulation and you remove a lot of cytokine by this way. Okay, this is typically the rationale that we are using when performing high volume hemofiltration. This is a study that we did together with Olivier Joannes Boyot from Bordeaux. 140 patients with septic shock and AKI, randomized to CVVH, either 70 ml per kilo per hour, high volume, or 35 ml per kg per hour, uh, normal volume at the time. 
And you see the Kaplan-Meier curve are not different either at 28 or 90 days. So 39% mortality at 28 days, 51% mortality at 90 days. No difference. But why the study failed? Well, we had put the same dose of antibiotics in the two groups back in 2004. And we were moving almost double in high volume. So all these people on high volume, they had very low concentration below the MIC of most antibiotics because we did measure the antibiotics as well. So that might be a reason. Another reason is a two-week rationale because we were thinking that we have removing unselectively cytokine mediator. We may remove pro-inflammatory mediator, anti-inflammatory mediator, good guy, bad guy, and also removing antibiotic, which is very bad, removing nutrients. So weak rationale. So really bad job, despite it's a randomized control study published in Intensive Care 2013. So how can we improve this? Well, a way to go is probably the last uh, hypothesis made by the group of John Kellam and Thomas Ribelay about the cytokinetic models as opposed to cytotoxins. So you see here the tissue and the blood. In the tissue, you have a lot of bacteria uh, in black cytokine, and then here in brown, some uh, leukocyte. And you have a lot of cytokine as well in the blood. So you remove cytokine from the blood, and then you have only a few cytokine in the blood, and you have a gradient, much more cytokine here. But the job of the cytokine is to attract the leukocyte in the body where they have to do their job to kill the bacteria. And the hypothesis that this was the case, because the gradient was high, the leukocyte went to the tissue to kill the bacteria. And they proved this by a nice animal model here. Uh, the first author was Peng. And you see the tissue of this uh, rat model. Uh, they had a lot of uh, bacteria, cytokines, a lot of cytokine in the blood. They removed the cytokine by using cytosorbin. And you see they have only a few cytokines left here, a lot there, gradient, and all the leukocytes are migrating into the tissue, the abdomen and lung infected tissue. So this is working. So this is nice because we have an animal model. It's not enough, but that's already great. Now we move on. What is the cytosorb at sober? Is it a filter? No, not at all. Look, cut down in two pieces. It's a amount of beds and highly biocompatible porous-polymer beds, removal of hydrophobic substances due to physio physiochemical properties and pore size. You see? Right? What about another big difference? Why it's not an MR filter? Very important. A classical MR filter has a surface about two square meters, a ping pong uh, table. Hmm, OK. What about a cytosol? Well, the classic sorbent have about a, a, a surface 5,000 square meters. It's already not that bad. But this one is about, whoa, 45,000 square meters. It's about four uh, football playing all together. You see, when you want to saturate this, good luck, because it's going to be a big job. Great. So a huge difference. And cytosol is really unique regarding the surface. Now, what is the cutoff? Well, we know the classical membrane is 30,000 Dalton here. The cutoff is higher, 60,000 Dalton. That means that most of the mediator of the inflammation cascade are above 30 and are not taken by conve convective therapy, maybe sometime adsorptive therapy. But this technique is able to remove most of the cytokine cascade, except endotoxin, which is about 100,000 Dalton to the week. It's here. And by the way, leaving a lot of albumin into the patient, because 
Halbimi is about 65. So pretty good. Moving on, should we use this as a hemoperfusion circuit like we do for premix therapy? Maybe not, because we cannot absorb endotoxin. And we know endotoxin is very early, maybe uh, 20, 48 hours before the multiple organ uh, failure. So why not put it in a circuit? So perhaps pulse filter, somewhat easy to do before the bubble trap, working very well, easy to do. Or maybe pre-filter, because we saw that pre-filter for low flow coverage is working much better. So, so far, we have to have more data to say if it's better post or pre. For sure, it's easier to place post, but we will uh, know uh, sooner uh, if pre is perhaps better. Now, human data. This is a study uh, done by a German group, and uh, they had 26 consecutive patients fulfilling the, infusion, the inclusion criteria, 13 post-surgery and 13 pneumonia. Um, these patients were in a retrospective study. And they could see that both vasopressor and lactate show a sustained reduction even beyond 72 hours after the cytosol treatment. SAPS2 decreased by almost 20%. So far, by more than 4%. And the actual mortality was lower than the predicted mortality by Apache 2 score, especially when the therapy was started within 24 hours. So early therapy again. So as I showed you, expected mortality, according to Apache 2, 92%. Pretty sick patient, almost dying and coming down to 69, so uh, a decrease of 25%, which is not bad, really. Okay, another study, this, this time prospective, but not randomized, from the group of Axel Neuros in Hamburg, uh, 20 consecutive patients with refractory septic shock, cytosol treatment was started within uh, eight hours, as a mean, which is very, very uh, rapid. This is important, obviously. Following the initiation of the therapy, the norodrin dose could be significantly reduced after respectively six hours, you see the p-value, and 12 hours. Lactate clearance improved significantly, and the shock reversal was achieved in 13 patients so 65% of the patient, that's something really important. 28 day survival was, according to the SOFA and the SAPS2, above 80%, came down to 45%, so nice reduction. So if I sum up, we have then a 28 day survival of 45%, where the expected uh, mortality was 80%, so this is a, a big difference and again shown here. Now, there is also a big registry where in Europe all the cases are um, put together in this big registry and it's run by Frank Brankhorst, a very known uh, uh, expert in sepsis. And he made a, a last presentation a few days ago about the correlation between the, the uh, hospital mortality in red line here, and in blue line, the Apache 2 uh, predicted uh, mortality. And you see in the less sick patient, there is almost no difference. But in the sick patient, Apache 2 between 30 and 35, and above 35, there is a relative reduction between the observed, uh, the uh, expect mortality and the observed mortality of 40%. So very impressive. So this is something to bear in mind, really. Now, we come back to our question, uh, first our conclusion, sorry. Sepsis is a frequent disease, poor prognosis, still in 2017, 
very expensive. In 2017, the last sepsis definition has taken immunology in the definition. That's very important because we know patients die of septic shock because of immunosuppression, and maybe cytosol may play a role here. Multicenter randomized control trial were all negative, but the question is, were they well designed? Many of question, which patient exactly? Personalized medicine, which timing? Which technique is best? How does this therapy exactly work? What about hybrid technique, futurist technique? What to ultimately remove? Cytokine, endotoxin, leukocyte, bacteria, virus, Hmm. Better rationale, strong rationale, that's the way to go. And cytosol is safe. About 27,000 applications, no adverse event, measure. Effect in removing inflammatory mediator, easy to use, promising clinical data so far, but we need randomized control data in the future. And back to our question. So, High volume of filtration is working in some RCT in septic shock and AKI. The rationale of blood purification is well understood for CRT and high volume. Euphrates is fully negative, confirmed last uh, Congress. Has been shown that selective therapy are better than unselective. We have no large RCT, not under power, that show that BP is working in sepsis. So let's vote. 20 seconds. Well, fantastic. The last was the good one, and 45%. That's pretty, was almost much better than in the beginning. So I finish with a quote from a French writer, Andre Gide, who said, believe those who are seeking the truth. Doubt a lot those who say we find it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, we are ready for, uh, uh, we have four minutes for questions. So, do you have uh, any specific question for Patrick Honoré? This one. Please. Uh, is there a microphone? Oh, there's the, a microphone coming. Yeah. The logistic of the room is not <laughs> so good for Thank you. Uh, two questions. One is how many times can you apply the procedure per patient? And the second, what are the side effects that uh, affect the quality of the blood cells after the uh, extracorporeal circulation? Okay. So regarding the first question, you can use on a daily basis, okay? Whenever your patient is septic, having a lot of uh, inflammatory mediator in the circulation, uh, very uh, still in shock. This is still a condition that you can carry on for several days. And you see, you saw on my side, you could put this on the CRT, so it run with the CRT, can run for several days. We have seen some case up to seven days. So that's the first uh, question. Regarding the second questions, uh, regarding side effect, um, there are still some questions, obviously. I have to be uh, honest on this. Uh, one of the main questions might be that we might also be removing, because it's unselective, good guys, so to say, in the blood, which might be antibiotics, which might be nutrient, but we have very uh, insufficient data up to know to be certain that's going to be the case. But there are some concern. That's a major concern. Regarding the blood cell, really not uh, that much. It's really regarding the, the loss of good guy in the blood. Okay? Yes. I may have a... a oh, sorry. 
I may have uh, some addition to the second question because we did the very original work on biocompatibility studies, especially on monocytes and especially on platelets. And uh, the circulation for hours through the uh, sorbent beads uh, are not actually affecting either monocyte activity nor platelet activity. So from the cell point of view, the beads are uh, uh, sufficiently biocompatible to avoid any kind of negative interference with the, uh, with the, with the cells. And this is an important issue because in most of the cases when you use the, the cartridge, uh, you see the beads at the end coming out very clean. So there are no, uh, let's say, uh, coagulation uh, fragments inside the, the, the sorbent bed. I think this is a very important issue. Thank you so much, Claudia, for adding. There is yes. another question over there. A question there, there, I don't know. You have the microphone, please. Um, having been one of the largest enrollers in Euphrates in the United States, after the amendment change that required sicker patients enrolled that might speak to that signal of perhaps a 12% mortality in the sickest patients, it became much more difficult to enroll. We we're looking at very much the tip of the iceberg. It's hard to imagine for a country like the United States how that trial is ever going to be replicated, looking at just those higher Apache patients, and thus this may be a treatment that, that, that's going to be uh, unapproachable in the United States just in terms of getting a multi-center trial that's that's going to confirm efficacy in those uh, sicker patients. And, and right now we don't have that data, and the FDA certainly isn't going to approve it on the basis of the signal in the Euphrates trial. Do you, do you have any prospects in that regard? Um, I may ask you then a question. Do you think in the U.S. this is the case because there is some delay between casualty, emergency department, and uh, the the... the the patient going into the ICU? Is this due to this, that you are expecting not having those very sick patients in the ICU to do the trial? It, 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 that, as a practical matter, though, getting patients enrolled any earlier is going to be very difficult. Okay. okay, so we agree. I think then in Europe, the situation is somewhat different because you have, we have closed ICU system and uh, the delay between the um, emergency uh, casualty admission and uh, the step into the ICU is uh, somewhat uh, significantly lower. So might be I don't have the exact numbers that the next study could be done perhaps in Europe, as you were suggesting. Because okay. of this. Thank you. We need to move to the next presentation, uh, still keeping open the question whether the randomized control trial will be the right tool to assess uh, the uh, uh, effectiveness of this, uh, of this device. Marlis?